welcome, welcome to Ask the Coach, which is our fourth series, and I am joined today with our guest, Paul McGee. Paul McGee is known as the Sumo Guy. Uh, he is one of Europe's leading speakers on change, motivation, and something else he'll talk about. So the Sumo principles and, and approach. <laughs> He's wrote hey, I'm many very books. good at talking about something else, whatever that something else is. <laughs> He, uh, he's wrote many books of, uh, I have predominantly most of them on my shelf and I have read all of them and uh, he's going to be sharing some of that knowledge and I believe it is a birthday of one of them it that is uh, indeed, he, would, yeah. he, will talk, he will talk about. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul McGee, our guest today. So Paul, tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what you do and uh, this magic that you have that Sumo. <laughs> this magic that I have. Well, thanks, Lorraine, and, and uh, good to see you all. Yeah, my background is in um, behavioural and social psychology. Uh, and when I graduated from university back in the late 1980s, I worked, uh, I had a role working with Unilever as an HR graduate management trainee, and I worked with one of their companies, Birdseye Walls. First six months of my job, very much just in an office pushing pen and paper. Then I have what I call a life changing conversation with a factory manager. He said, Paul, do you know it'd be really good for your development if you spent some time actually in the factory managing the 30 women on the economy beef burger line? And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, bring it up. Seems like a good development opportunity. Two main lessons. Number one, do not eat economy beef burgers. And secondly, I also learned this, when arrogance meets ignorance, that is a really dangerous cocktail. And I think Looking back now, I realised, I mean, I enjoyed my student life. It was a good development time for me, but it kind of prepared me for a graduation. It didn't prepare me for life necessarily. Um, big change for me after 12 months of working in Unilever, I actually became ill, not due to the beef burgers, but I became ill with an illness called ME, or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or yuppie flu. Was ill for three years. After three years, I felt I was probably well enough to get a little part-time job, but I couldn't because no one had hired me because I couldn't pass a medical. So it was in, back in 1991, 29 years ago, looking at the gallery before most of you were born, I, I actually hired myself and was amazing at the interview, standout candidate. And, and since then, yeah, written a few books, spoken in a few countries, actually done some work with one of the people that's online with us today, Andy Gilbert. But it was actually in um, 2002, I was doing a coaching and counselling skills course as an associate trainer for another company up in Glasgow. And at some stage in that workshop, someone said the following, well, if all else fails, you can always tell them to sumo. So everyone looks at this person and we all like, went sumo and he went, Shut up, move on, which if you're Scottish, I do apologise for, don't sue me for the poor accent. And it was just a little catchphrase, and um, I started to weave it into some of my sessions occasionally, and it seemed to kind of like stand out for people and became quite memorable. And over time, I, I, I had a set of ideas and principles anyway, but sumo became this umbrella term to describe some of these ideas and principles. Now, when I use the word sumo, shut up, move on. Some people immediately love it and other people go, well, I think that sounds rather aggressive. And, and I guess what I wanted to explain was it's not meant to be aggressive. It's meant to be provocative to get your attention. Uh, maybe if you're an LLP, it's to cause a bit of a state change when you suddenly hear this and think, well, what's all this about? And um, for me, don't oh, shut up really is about stop, think, reflect, press pause, before moving on. And we do talk a lot about the importance of taking action, which is crucial, but I think some people almost like dive into the action before they take a bit of time to do some stopping, thinking, reflecting and planning. And um, over time, we've developed Sumo to work in schools as well. However, um, I had an interesting conversation with a primary school head teacher a few years ago. It was like, she said, look, Paul, I love Sumo, um, but I've got a bit of a problem. And that's what it actually stands for. One of the parents said to me recently, my son George keeps on going about sumo. What is it? She said, I felt a bit awkward going, uh, it's an acronym, it stands for shut up, move on. George is seven, we're at primary school, and one of our values is show respect. And I don't think you show respect by telling people to shut up. 
So I'd like you to change the title of your program. And at the time, I'm like, Linda, it's my brand. I've spent years developing it. She said, yes, I know. And I do love it. But if you don't change it, I don't think we can use it anymore. And it was like, I said to her, have you got any ideas we can call it? And she said, no. I went, thanks for the feedback. But we did decide to take a bit of step back and think, okay, this is one primary school teacher who's uncomfortable with what the acronym stands for. There could be quite a lot of others. And so it also now stands for stop understand move on but here's the really exciting thing Ten, uh, 2010 someone sends me a message and goes love your books love sumo and i guess you already know the following that sumo as a word not as an acronym but as a word in latin can mean to choose and i talk a lot about the kind of choices we make and the consequences of those choices so shut up move on stop understand move on or to choose that's kind of the sumo journey but very briefly the book sumo came out 2005 may the 27th so today i am celebrating um 15 years of sumo being out it was rejected by 13 publishers and it went on to become a sunday times bestseller so whistle stop tour a bit about myself and also, finally, I'm a Wigan Athletic season ticket holder. So I've actually been practicing social distancing for several years. Thank you ever so much, Paul. That was a fantastic introduction. And I, you know, I was very fortunate to meet Paul many years ago. And um, I brought him back as a guest speaker in my last, my last role. And everyone was blown away by the Sumo principles. And actually, some of it is very simple to understand, but so profound in how you really think about things. So um, one, of the, one of the sayings you talk about is carp dien, isn't it? Have I pronounced that right? Yeah, well, people can pronounce it, but I mean, it's interesting. I once wrote on a flip chart, carpe diem. Uh, what, any ideas what it stands for? So that's a Latin phrase. And, and a woman went, um, is it to do with fishing? Um, and no carp has not got anything to do with fishing, but it's yet all about seizing the day. And um, that is something which has kind of like lived with me ever since I saw actually the film Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams. And if you haven't seen it, it's definitely a film I'd recommend. Perfect. Okay, Paul, thank you ever so much. What I'm going to do is just going to put it back on to our main view and open up to anyone in the room. Uh, does anyone have a question to ask Paul about him, himself, or what he does? Uh, if you can just pop your hand up. Suze, okay? Paul, I am really sorry about the noisy workman outside, so I'll be no worries. really quick. But yeah, I've loved your books for years too. And my question is now, um, with in our unprecedented times, what are your how have you updated Sumo and specifically the how not to worry? It was great that you put it free on Amazon, so downloaded that. Thank you. But how do we not worry about what we don't know and what could well, we don't know what could happen? So that's my question. Sure, well, I think I mean, there's a, I suppose there's a couple of questions within that. I think the first one is how have I adapted my message? And the fact is, yeah, I mean, I wrote the book in 04, it came out in 05, and we were not actually, <clears throat> I talked a lot about stress, but things like well-being, emotional resilience, mental health, were not really on people's radar. So in many respects, my sumo message seems to be even more relevant now than it was when the book first came out. So for me, what I've been doing on all the webinars that I've done, and I was doing a webinar in Chicago last week from the courtesy and comfort of, of this office, is really not saying I'm here to talk about sumo, because, you know, sumo is a vehicle, it's a set of ideas. People on one level aren't bothered about sumo. What they're bothered about is give me some strategies and also give me some understanding as how I deal with my present situation. And when we talk about uh, not worrying. I mean, in the book, I actually, uh, in the book, How Not to Worry, I actually, I'm not one of these people who go, you know, no worries. And every time you worry, it's a waste of energy. No, 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 no. That is just such an easy bandwagon to get on. What we need to appreciate is I think there are actually, in, you could broadly speaking say there's two types of worry. There is worth it worry. 
and there is worthless worry. Now we evolved as a species 150,000 years ago on the African savanna. You're going out for a Sunday stroll with your mate Colin and hoping you might bring some food back for the evening for the rest of the gang. And you come across a, uh, a, a plane full of, not a plane, not an aeroplane, but a plane in an area where there's all these grazing gazelles. And you're going, we got ourselves some food here. This is great. They can't attack us. We can take them down. In the distance, in the corner of your eye, you notice the lion. And all of a sudden, you're not worried about your meal for tonight. You're, wor you're worried, you're fearful that you could become someone else's meal. Now, the brain prioritizes bad news. So we need to understand that we actually owe our very survival as a species to our, our fear reaction, our fight or flight response. And I talk about, based on the work by Daniel Kamen, Thinking Fast and Slow, I talk about fast brain and I talk about represented with this red baseball cap. And then he also talks about our slow brain, a more rational part of our brain. Now, what I'm finding is happening now is that, <clears throat> you know, COVID-19 is something to be concerned about, particularly if you're, you've got elderly parents or you've got an underlying health issue. I, no offense, I think it's pathetic for anybody to say, oh, well, don't worry. Of of course you will have some degree of fear and some worry and some concern and so therefore what do you do you engage more of that blue cap that more logical rational thinking and you go okay we do need to wash our hands regularly maybe i do need to shield myself maybe i do need to practice this social distancing and that worry or that certain degree of fear can drive you to take some action that keeps you safe just like when you see the lion in the distance 150,000 years ago, you don't turn to your mate Colin and go, we'll be reached, don't worry, keep positive, positive mental attitude. No, 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 no. You go, we need to take some kind of strategy here. Either we're going to fight it, and I don't fancy our chances, Colin, or we're going to flee from it. So understand that some part of worry can be a healthy trigger to help you take some necessary action. The problem now we're getting is what I would call also worthless worry or where we just become so hijacked by our fast primitive emotional brain that we are feeding our minds with constant fear stories, some of them which actually might just be pure speculation, some of them that are actual opinion but being presented as facts. And yet it activates that red cap, that fast brain, it releases that cortisol, that adrenaline. We're feeling anxious about things. And I feel if we're not careful, one of the things that's really crucial in this time is what I would call manage your mental diet. And it's deciding what do I consume now in terms of information? Because if you were lost at sea, out in a boat, you could die of thirst. And yet you're surrounded by water. But the water is salt water. So you drink it, it actually dehydrates you, causes your system ultimately to break down, and you die. What I think is really important now is to think maybe there's some worth it worry, so don't beat myself up about that, but is this this worthless worry, or is this immense anxiety that is overwhelming me, and am I reaching for information, because the red cap, fast brain, does not like uncertainty. So any information we can get we crave for. The problem is some of that information is like drinking salt water, which is why one of the things that I've been doing as a practice for over a year now, even before COVID-19, is I have three questions I ask myself every single day. And in fact, the first one I ask myself just as I'm drifting off to sleep, and it's simply this, what am I thankful for? F-O-U-R. And I replay the day and think of all the things I'm thankful for. I know we have an inbuilt negativity bias. I know my brain, my red cap, prioritizes bad news because above all, it wants to protect us. But if I'm not careful, I drift off to sleep. And I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is replaying negative stuff and, and fear stories. So I take some control. There's loads of things I can't control, but what can, I can control 
is what I think about and focus on. So I replay the day. What am I thankful for? I don't even get out of bed in the morning until I've done another what am I thankful for exercise. Two other questions that I ask myself are, um, how can I show kindness to others? Or how am I showing kindness to others? Which immediately gets on the radar. This is not all about Paul McGee. How can I be showing some kindness and support to other people? What neuroscience now tells us is this, that we don't just simply, um, not only is showing kindness and support to someone good for them, it's good for us. It releases dopamine, it releases serotonin, and it releases oxytocin. In other words, you're getting a, a cocktail of chemicals being released in your brain that make you feel good. So going back to Suzanne's question, which was probably asked about half an hour ago, and some of you are thinking, does he stop for breath ever? <laughs> the point I want to make is this. I don't think it's a question of trying to stop something. I think it's more a question of what do you replace those thoughts with? The mind can't really cope with a vacuum. So don't beat yourself up about some of your worries because they might be legitimate and they are worth it. But I think sometimes we can get so caught in, in worry about things that are, haven't even happened and, and through, you know, which causes our anxiety. And rather than saying, I will stop worrying, think about what can I start doing? So what am I thankful for? How am I showing kindness to others? And here's your third question to ask yourself every single day. How am I showing kindness to myself? Because I think maybe in our role as coaches and maybe as parents and maybe as people who've got, you know, elderly relatives, family members, I understand why we want to support everybody else. I want to do my best to support other people. You know what? Sometimes you've got to show a bit of kindness to yourself. I was ill with COVID-19. It wiped me out for a couple of weeks. And one of the things that I learned was this. I came down to this very office where I'm now speaking to you from, and I've got a book coming out later on this year aimed at teenagers and trying to support them. And I remember my goal was, because I was so unwell, so lacking in energy, but one of my goals was every single day, try and edit a page of the book. Sometimes I have the energy to do too. Do you know, one day I came downstairs, came into this office, looked at what I had to do, and I thought, I haven't got the fight for this anymore. I have not got the fight for this anymore. 2008, I kind of tried to get my business to survive the financial crisis. 2010, three-quarter page article in the Daily Mail, basically dissing the kind of material that I put out there. I thought it would destroy my business. It didn't. Got through that, but I actually thought to myself, can I really take this? Every, every event I've got in the diary, it's been decimated at the moment. And then I just thought to myself, it's almost like an inner voice from in, within me just said, you know what, Paul? You don't need to have the fight for the future. You just need to have the fight for today. Because how you deal with your day will prepare you for your tomorrow. And I just decided at that point, not to, I need to learn about Zoom, which I tried to even though I was really ill. I'm not gonna try and think about my backdrop. I'm not even gonna think about my business. I'm just gonna think, maybe I need to show a bit of kindness to myself here. Have a little bit of self-compassion and look after me a little bit because if I can look after me, then if I get well, which fortunately I did, then I'm in a better position to support other people. So I reckon that's probably the end of the seminar. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. That oh, was I a... hope that helped you, as Suzanne, and I hope it maybe thought was thought provoking for other people as well. No, that was a great question and really well answered. And I think I think Paul, one of the things is that you know you say it in such a way that is easy to digest. You know, some people make it so complicated, and actually, that's what I really liked and how you know when I connected with you. Uh, I've been able to use everything that you've showed, so, so thank you. Uh, so who is next? Who would like to ask a question? Anna. Hi, Paul. Hi, Anna. Um, I'm a big fan of the Seven Habits. Yeah. And I saw in, your, um, in the invite for this event that you'd worked with Stephen Covey. Um, and I just wondered what... Um, what are the things that you've most, what are the things that you've taken away from the seven habits? I think for me, um, <clears throat> so 
I read The Seven Habits before I met Stephen Covey. In fact, The Seven Habits as a book came out in 1989, which was the year I lost my job through ill health. And fast forward a few years and I've been reading the book and I, I really felt that for me, Seven Habits brought a depth to personal development that a lot of other self-help books didn't. And it was around about 06, 07, I get contacted by an organization in Australia and they go, we would like to invite you, we've read the streamer book, we'd like to invite you to speak at our conference in Sydney, at the Sydney Convention Center. I went, wow, that'd be amazing. And they told me about the pay for flights and everything else. Um, and then they said, and, and you're also been on the same bill as Dr. Stephen Covey. In fact, he's on in the morning and you immediately follow him. So even in our conference program, you'll be on the same page as him and one thing or another. And I'm going, they're really selling this. And they went, oh, by the way, because we've got Dr. Stephen Covey, we've spent all our speaker budget on him. <laughs> and he's the one that will put bums on seats. No offence, Paul, but no one's heard of you in Australia. So we think you'll be a great addition, but we actually can't pay you. We can just pay you travel and five nights accommodation. So I, uh, but I, I seized that opportunity, going back to the point Lorraine mentioned before, it's like seize the day. And actually did get some work out in Australia and have done ever since. But what I made also as an intention was um, to try whenever I got a chance just to spend some time with him and, and to talk to him about things. I mean, he wanted to talk more about his family. He had, I mean, he's obviously passed away now. He had 50, that's five zero, grandchildren. <laughs> and he wanted to talk more about his family stuff. But he also showed some interest in, in the kind of work that I was doing as well. And in some ways, people say that sumo on one level is almost a bit of a simplified seven habits i wouldn't quite put it that way but it's a book that's influenced me and i think one of the habits i talk about a fair bit is uh, habit number two which i think is uh, begin with the end in mind and what we're going through at the moment it's easy to react to things but again yeah. he also talks about i think it's habit number one be proactive and for me I'm constantly thinking about begin with the end in mind. What do I want my outcome to be? Because in the Sumo book, I've got this little formula E plus R equals O. It's the event plus my response that influences the outcome. Now, for years, I lived with an alternative formula subconsciously without realizing it, which was E equals O. In other words, if that's the event, you know what the outcome is going to be. Well, certain events happen now in my life pre-COVID and we would post-COVID. And I've realized that, okay, that's the event, but Paul, I could influence the outcome here. You know, to begin with the end in mind, what do you want your outcome to be? Yeah. So, I, I, so was privileged to speak at the same conference. He earned a few quid more than I did. <laughs> was privileged to spend a little bit of time with him. And I guess what was most revealing was his desire to not boast about what he was doing, but more to talk about his family. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thank you Anna for the question. And I, again, the, that event equation um, has been, um, I think, profound in my life because you know, it's, it's almost that where you're coming from a cause or effect, isn't it? That same, uh, you know, is it happening to me or for me? I kind of, yeah, so thank you for explaining that. Uh, anyone else in the room would you like to ask a question? I'm just going to talk to Facebook just for a second. Anyone that's watching on Facebook, if you wonder, if you just joined and wonder what's happening, we are uh, running Ask the Coach with Paul McGee, the sumo guy. So if you do have any questions, just pop a comment in the box and I will, uh, I will ask the questions for when we have time. So back to the room. Who has a question for Paul? Uh, Andrew, if you unmute yourself. Thank you. Yep, got it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Paul, there's obviously a lot of psychology about what you're talking about, but have you had to do a lot of formal training in psychology, or is this it's more a case of observing and taking those observations and turning them into actions? I did a four year degree <clears throat> which incorporated behavioral and social psychology and also equipped me with a, a professional qualification to become either a social worker or probation officer. So that was the kind of the basis, but I'll be really honest with you, the kind of psychology I seemed to look at then was like the psychology of failure. 
Um, it was only really when I became ill and, and someone let, let me a set of audio cassette tapes, which dates me somewhat, and it, it, it triggered an interest in what I realise now as being framed by the work of Martin Seligman as positive psychology. So although my background is in psychology, although I've done a diploma in counselling and I've got a, diplo a diploma in performance coaching, for me, really, Andrew, a lot is now about my own reading, my own research, my own observation, and also dealing with my own flipping challenges as a human being and my own flaws and my own failings. And I think hopefully what helps other people is I don't come from some you know, academic background and, and come up with some complex models and theories but I talk about issues going on with my wife, Helen, or being a good father or trying to be a good father to my two kids. So for me, and also with the, with the onset and development of, of neuroscience and understanding more about our brain, I think clearly some of the stuff I learned in, nine, in, the, in the 80s at university wouldn't be that relevant. And we know a lot more now. And some of my, you know, my close friends are in this kind of field and perhaps sad though it might be, I'm passionate about this subject. I fucking love it. If so for me, a day off, I might still be reading an interesting book by uh, Sean Aker on, on the happiness of fact advantage. There's all kinds of things. And on Monday, bank holiday, I was having a chat with a friend of mine, Dr. Linda Shaw, who's a neuroscientist. So I just, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this. There's so many things I just not, don't interest me in life whatsoever, but people and how we can get the best out of ourselves and others definitely um you know is a passion that captivates me thank you andrew uh sarah and then lynn hi thanks sarah um sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to know sometimes <laughs> um paul hi thank you for your for um your insights this afternoon um i wondered well one of um my current favorites uh, pieces of work is um, by Dan Siegel and the hand model of the brain and his work on fight and flight. I didn't know if that's something that um, that you've incorporated into your work. Or... Um, you'd have to unpack it a little bit for me because I used to explain the brain. Did you say the hand model? Yeah, it's something called the hand model and I can tell it very, very quickly. But well, Is a... it the one way, because well, I've done yeah. this and that's like the primitive part of our brain it's, there's the limbic system and then you've got your higher brain it's is got, it that one or is it something this, else it's it's similar you've got your hand and there's three elements to it there's the yeah. kind of very primitive bit which is the palm then there's yeah. the, the kind of old mammalian bit um yeah. containing the medulla, and then there's the prefrontal cortex so he just explains that and i was just thinking with your work about worry um and fight or flight and looking at between the worth it and the worthless worry um, the, uh, the, the trick I found or the kind of difficulty I found is, um, I guess, determining between the two and then what do you do about the worthless worry? And sometimes their hand model helps with that. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things that, um, I think with all the work that I do and that other people do, the key thing is how can you explain something in a simple, visual, memorable way? So for me, it's become yeah. baseball caps. Fast, yeah. primitive, emotional part of our brain can hijack us at times. It's fast, automatic, instinctive, impulsive, reacts, only thinks short term. And then there's the more blue cap, the higher brain. And I look at different strategies to engage that. The other idea I have is imagining that this, the two caps, it's like a, it's like a car and this is your accelerator. And, and that one is more your, your brakes. And to enjoy the journey, you need both. So I, I was vaguely aware, Sarah, of, of that model. It's been described to me previously. I suppose for me personally, when I'm talking about things, I don't want to overload people with too many different concepts or models. And yeah. for me, having kind of developed the kind of red and blue cap, that's what really sticks out for people. It's not a better or worse, because obviously, uh, Dr. Stephen Peters talks about the chimp paradox and about yeah. your inner chimp. But I'd rather kind of like say, well, look, Dr. Stephen Peters, you, you do your chimp stuff. Other people have different ways of explaining it. And, and, and I think it reaches people in different ways. Yeah, I think the red and blue crap, um, red and blue caps work really well. That's a great idea. Thank you. Visual. And it's one where we're doing it in schools. 
Yeah. It, it's just a very, very, very <laughs> memorable um, sort of visual metaphor. And, in, and the, one of the, the first main chapter of the new book for teenagers is called There's Something Amazing Inside You. And it's all about the most complex thing on the planet, which is actually the human brain. And I, I realise I'm oversimplified it with a couple of baseball caps, but it's just helping children to understand a bit about how their brain works. And also, when you're going through adolescence, it's really hard for a young teenager, or even an old teenager, to always access their blue cap. In fact, it can be pretty tough for adults as well. So it's a metaphor that I've been using. I'm not going to unpack it all now, but it is, it's worth, I think it's a way of understanding our behavior and the behavior of other people around us. So is Dan Siegel, was that who you said, Sarah? Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll Dan check out Siegel, stuff. yeah. And when's the book, the book for teenagers out? It's going to be out. I'll let Lorraine know. It's going to be out in October. I am so flipping excited about it because ultimately I'm excited because in many ways it's a partnership between me. I've come up with the content and all the ideas, but there's no way a young person is going to read it unless it's brilliantly produced. And some of the illustrations are just off the charts. I used an illustrator I've worked with previously and she has so embraced this whole uh, concept of trying to help young people so it's probably one of the most mm. visually 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 memorable uh, books aimed at teenagers that I've come across I know Matthew Syed has got a book out called you are awesome and there's some great stuff in there as well but uh, for me I'm excited because I feel it's a real collaboration and partnership and I was just as an aside I felt so strongly that the book's success wouldn't just be about content but its presentation and its visual impact that I basically took a pay cut in terms of my royalties and I've given some of them to the illustrator as well because I felt I needed to get her engagement when she has been massively engaged. So comes out in October. Great, sounds great, thank you. Okay, Lynn. Okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. We can indeed, Lynn. Hi. Well, I had two questions and um, you've already kind of answered some of them because my, my first question was going to be your top five books because as, as an avid learner, I want to learn from people who also do personal development. So first of all, it was your top five books. And, and that's kind of like, oh, you know, oh, my goodness, you're not even by your bookshelf to look at what they are. <laughs> um, so it might have to come later. My other question um, ties in with being a an ex vicar's wife for 15 years um i can see that a lot of people who do the kind of things that you do actually have a deeper faith in something or a deeper belief in something and i think my question really was how do you integrate and marry that with the things that you do okay so firstly my top five books i don't really have a top top five books i would say though because i think it all evolves and develops but Covey and the Seven Habits has stood the test of time. 1989, over 30 years ago, and I still think there is some real quality depth to his actual material. But I mean, Andy Gilbert, who's on the call, there will be certain books he's written, and I can get a gem or an insight from what he's written about. I'd say that one of my favourites, I am recommending a lot at the moment, if you're not come across it already, is by a guy called James Clear, C-L-E-A-R, called Atomic Habits. That is a go-to book big time. And it's not a book, but Mark Manson, who wrote a book that sold, I think, at least over two million, maybe more copies, far more than Sumo has, called The Art of Not Giving a F-U-C-K. He has a newsletter and uh, I subscribe to that. And Again, he just comes up with, on a month, every Monday, a newsletter comes out and it's thought provoking, it's really good stuff. Now going on to your second part of your question, um, I'm really uncomfortable with labels. So if I was to say, you know, I'm an atheist or I'm a Christian, you make certain assumptions maybe about me, about who I am as a person. Now, I would actually um, relate more so the, well, as a friend, well, a friend of mine, someone who I know a little bit called Rob Bell talks about the Jesus tradition. So for me, yes, my faith is important, but I think 
when you use the word which could describe a faith is oh so you're a christian it's such a broad spectrum it's like saying well i'm a football supporter and therefore you know exactly what i'm like as a human being you don't but there is something actually interesting in the new testament where um one of the writers of one of the letters says be transformed by the renewing of your mind and i'm thinking that was written two thousand years ago and, and if you think about Jesus's teachings, whether you, you know, you're going, oh, flipping heck, he's going all religious on me. Look, forget that for a moment. Just look at some of those stories, whether you think they're myths or not. And, and you realize the principles of Christianity and of other faiths as well. It talks about showing kindness. And now you've got neuroscience going, actually, do you know what? When you show kindness to other people, it's good for you. Jesus tells a story about, you know what? Before you remove the speck from your brother's eye, how about you remove the plank from your own? And I'm like, Jesus is doing a little short mini masterclass on self-awareness and don't be too quick to judge other people. So yes, I, I have a faith. I think this is not a cold, dark, ultimately meaningless universe. I think there is something beyond that. I don't like to pigeonhole myself in a box. And I think if you called me a Christian and I had a chat with another Christian, you'd find there's masses of things that we don't actually agree with. And I could have a drink with a good mate who's an atheist and realize there's loads of things that we do have a real interest and share a similar view on. So I hope that kind of answers your question. I don't know if you need to probe a little bit more, Lynn, but that's a little bit hopefully helps you. No, it does. It's brilliant because um, my previous life, makes you more cynical than something else but i'm like that more holistic looking things and yeah not labels so fantastic it's just lovely to get your take on it so thank you thank you lynn for the question um gary just find the mute button um hi paul and um, thanks thank lauren you. for organizing this it's good to good to hear um so my question was around kind of organizational resilience and i think we're in a particular state at the moment where we're asking because I, I work in the, the contact centre space, so I work with a lot of frontline leaders, frontline managers, uh, and we're asking a lot of our frontline teams, so people on the, on the frontline taking calls and things like that, to maintain their resilience. And we're asking leaders to be resilient and also look after other people's resilience at the same time. Um, and I just wondered what's your take on kind of organizational culture and kind of how people are building resilience within their organizations and how you can apply some of your principles and some of your experience to that to create a more um, well-rounded organizational culture if that makes any sense Tom. <laughs> it, it, it does it does Gary I think what I, I what I find is I give you a distorted answer of my experience because it's distorted because the organizations that I work with who hire my services and have been hiring my services over the last few weeks fully appreciate that we need to invest in our in our staff in how to develop their resilience improve their emotional and mental well-being and help them to understand even things like the red and blue cap and manage your manage your mental diet and i've got this other concept about why we need hippo time what a hippo is doing what they wallow and we need a bit of hippo time but not spend too long there so there's a lot of different ideas I have, and I'm doing two workshops next week for leaders who lead people. And what is just interesting, I guess, Gary, is the people who really know that we need to support people, they are the ones that are engaging my service. So I don't come across the organizations who are just telling staff to get on with it, who are furloughing them, who are making them redundant, who aren't offering any support. They exist, but I don't come across them because I only come across the people who are actually saying, we need some help. And the organization I worked with in Chicago, what was really great was a comment from one of the team on LinkedIn the day after, which had been, yes, she got a lot from the session, but she thanked the CEO for arranging it in the first place because she said, I just feel you're making a real statement to staff. One other organization I've worked with actually said we've got a bit of an us and them going on at the moment because some of our staff are working and some of them are furloughed and the staff who are working and they're in the pharmaceutical sector are really buzzing and there's a real team spirit so they said what we want to do is we want to do something purely for our furloughed workers 
And so they run a session for people who weren't in work because they want to make them feel valued. And I'll tell you what else they did. They said to this team, we're going to be running this event. And if you've got any family members who want to join the Zoom call, they're free to do so. So I think we just need to appreciate we're not prepared for this. We don't know how to deal with it. We are in almost like a bit of a maze, blindfolded at times. But there are some good things out there. There are some good things that were out there before this crisis. And I think organisations are now reaching out to try and get that kind of support because we're not, we can't just tell people to be resilient. We can't mm. just say to people, come and be buoyant and be positive. We need to give them a set of tools and insights to manage their own well-being. And for leaders especially, I would say this. I used to say the following. I've changed my mind. Leaders, you've got to be a thermostat, not a, not a, so you've got to be a thermostat, not, not a thermometer. In other words, I was saying you've got to set the temperature, not take it. Well, actually, I think you need to do both. So your own well-being as a leader, the way you lead yourself will have an impact on your team. So you just be aware that is the influence you have. So if you're struggling, if you're despairing, if you're down in the dumps, well, guess where your team's going to be? So on one level, you've got to invest in yourself, own oxygen mask on first, because you've got to be the thermostat. You've got to set the temperature, but you've also got to take the temperature. And that means... It is about having one-to-ones with people. I was in a WhatsApp group, and, and I think this, this, I came across this almost by, by accident. But to begin with, we're all just sending funny memes and videos to each other. And then, then one of the guys in this WhatsApp group, as a fellow speaker, just said, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is fantastic, where are you? And people were sort of like putting in what their, their numbers were. And one person was a seven, another was an eight, another said, I've had a great week, I'm a nine. The person who asked the question was a five. Now that suddenly made me realize he's telling us his temperature. And it would have been easy for me to go, oh, well, you know where I am if you need me or send another funny video. And I thought, this guy's actually reaching out for some help here. So what did I do within, within a few hours? I was ringing him up to see how he was. So I think really effective leaders know they need to kind of like be the thermostat, which isn't easy. That's why they need all the support they can, but they need to take the temperature. And I think if I was, when I, when I spoke to this guy, I said to him, I noticed you said you were a five. Just tell me a bit more about that. And, and, and I think also so asking the question, so how long do you, have you felt like you're a five? Because sometimes people just had a bad morning and you caught them at the wrong time and they're a five, but actually normally they, they could be a seven or an eight. So that's part of, that's I guess some of my thoughts really, Andrew. I get a distorted picture because I only work with the companies that tend to be supporting their people. Yeah, I think the point that you said there about... Sorry, Gary, my apologies, Gary. Yeah, no, no, don't worry, it's all right. Uh, it's, um, I think the, the, the bit that kind of resonated there is actually people who know they've got a problem come for help. I suppose it's how do we reach those that don't necessarily know that they've got a problem and how do we kind of help them come to the, um, come to the conclusion that they do have one. It's, it's a really tricky, tricky. Um... It, it is. And I think it's what, why these events can be so useful is firstly, everyone gets the message and, and part of what I'm telling people is not, um, this is what you need to do. Some of it is, this is what you need to be aware of. You know, self-awareness is a gift. And if you can start to remove some of the kind of the masks from people and, and realize, help them to realize, maybe I am struggling. Maybe I do need to get some structure. Even asking questions like, on average, how many hours a night are you sleeping? Because someone's saying, oh, I tend to get by on four. I'm watching Netflix series until about three in the morning. <laughs> then I'm up at seven. And then you get a speaker in who can start to share some stuff about the importance of sleep. Then slowly, hopefully, people can become more aware. But I'd also say this, Gary. You know, there are people who need help who don't ask for it. There are people who need help and are offered it and refuse to take it. Because I still think there can be this sort of like this pride that can be a barrier. And, and I've always said seeking support is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. But not everyone will still go for that. 
but on, even on when I did this another event recently in Cumbria rather than in Chicago what was great was there was some opportunity to ask questions before the event anonymously and also post some questions during the session anonymously and I think that was invaluable because people I think felt more comfortable talking or asking questions that were a concern to them yeah definitely no that's really useful that Paul thank you pleasure thank you thank you for bringing the the question up Gary because I know that it is on a lot of people's minds at the moment around if people have been furloughed and if they haven't and how they're gonna you know integrate that back into the workplace um but you know some of the some of the things that have been very much talked about is around this emotional intelligence model and i think if we can really think about empathy but empathy in the right way for we are all different as well so you know if we understand different personality styles we can manage that process better as well but great question i think paul we have time for one more question uh, and then we'll sort of bring the session to a close so any other questions from the room uh, on Facebook, it's gone quite quiet. There's no questions coming up there. I have a, a question. Uh, if nobody else has a question, are you sure? Anybody else got a question? Andy, okay. <laughs> you beat me. <laughs> oh, can you unmute? Uh, Paul, thank you for being my warm up man today. Um, how many questions do you think I will answer next week? More than me. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I will say that I actually published Paul's first book called 60 Minutes to a Calmer Life and one day we didn't sell many copies one day well, I'm going to put it on uh, eBay for 10 grand mate so it will be a collector's <laughs> item by then probably will be let's hope so so, so Paul my, my question is um, you've obviously got the book but what else what's what's coming is there any any other insight as to what paul mcgee is taking into the future i suppose well it's interesting my big project has been in the last few months is about running my business and then has been about writing this book for teenagers what's become really important now is not to think i've now submitted the book it's like i my big project now is how do i tap into a network how do i get that book into the hands of many parents and teachers and young people as possible. So that's almost like my next project because I'm not relying on the publisher to make that happen. I don't write, you know, a Sunday Times, a, 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 a Times newspaper column every week that Matthew Syed does. I don't have a podcast with, with Freddie Flintoff. So I haven't got the profile of some people who have now operated in this space. So I'm calling in favours, seeking support, because I feel passionate about this book. We're also be raising money for the mental health charity Young Minds. So that is probably at the moment my real overwhelming focus. Having said that, I'm going to be writing, a, I'm co-authoring for the first time ever a book with a guy who I would recommend comes on here called Andy Cope. There's something about the name Andy. Um, and he wrote a book <laughs> called The Art of Being Brilliant. And has oh, written yes. several other books as well and he would be great so i'm going to be co-writing a book with him and then literally an hour before this call someone contacted me about maybe setting up some online business about supporting and mentoring people but i've said look i'm not very good at multitasking and maybe multitasking is a myth anyway so i need to get this book out i need to get the focus on all the marketing i need to have this new pub, um manuscript for the new book with the publisher in December. But if we launch another online business, maybe in the new year, I'll explore that and look at it. So a few things, and also just adapting to the fact that at the moment, I mean, I do have dates in the diary, but they're all incredibly provisional in terms of speaking in public. So just seeing how I can connect with people in a more virtual way. So there's plenty to keep me busy and hoping that Wigan Athletic avoid relegation to League One. Okay, and, and just sort of just to bring kind of the session to a close and then I'll just uh, share who our next guest speaker is. Um, what is, what's the final tip? I think the guys have probably got so much out of you over the last hour, but is there one last pause tip that you could give to everyone for uh, how they can get through the next week? 
I think the next week and just throughout our lives, it's, it's actually inspired by my encounters with a parking machine in Scarborough. About three years ago, I'm working from McCain Foods in Scarborough and the hotel I was staying the night before, it was a, 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 it was a car park across the way you had to pay. I go, into the, to go to the machine to put my money in and all of a sudden the display in the machine lit up and just went, change is possible. And I'm like, looking around, but change is possible. And, and I think actually that's, those three words are massively important. Our role as coaches is to let people know when you say, well, that's just the way I am and I can't change. <laughs> change is possible. And I think for us going forward, no matter how good we are, we need to appreciate, um, you know, that maybe the, the barrier to us learning is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And let's recognize that sometimes we need to change, we need to learn, and we need to grow. And, and I never dreamed I'd be writing a book for teenagers, and I am. I never dreamed I'd be doing events in, in Sri Lanka and Chicago and Cumbria via Zoom, looking at a little light on the laptop. But I am now doing that. And I'm a 55 year old bloke who might, some people think, might be winding down. Maybe I'm just getting started. So a message to ourselves to get through all of this and a message to our clients and the people we live and work with, change is possible and maybe we can help each other to do that. Fantastic, thank you. And I'll be definitely getting the book, My Daughter Turns a Teenager, this October. So, uh, so that's perfect timing. Um, so thank you so much, Paul, for your time uh, today to share with everyone else. And thank you for answering can, everyone's can questions. I yeah. And that is, it, because I I'm literally can't get a lot of feedback from you, if you have got any comments about the session, um, and particularly if there's anything I said that was helpful, if you can put it in the comments book, because clearly when I'm speaking in public, I get a reaction and I can talk to people at the end. It's quite a bizarre experience to actually be having to avoid eye contact with you. It also gives the impression I am making eye contact with you. So if you've got, I couldn't really see any reactions when I'm speaking. So if there's anything you found helpful, um, then please put it in the in the chat box because that's useful information and feedback for me. Yeah, and I'll save the chat, uh, or you can save the chat actually, can't you? On your end. <laughs> okay, no so I'm still I'm still I'm still embracing technology. I'm just <laughs> I'll, glad I'll save I'll save it. The screen. Yeah, no, that's no problem at all. Um, and website so is sumoguy.com if you want to access more information. Yeah, and I'm also going to be pulling this video together and it will be available on YouTube and it will have all of Paul McGee's details on there so you can get in touch and uh, keep a look out for his book coming. Um, so just to quickly say, we actually have our next uh, guest speaker in the room, uh, Andy Gilbert from Go Mad Coaching. Um, Andy, do you just want to quickly just say hi and then, uh, then they have to wait till next week? <laughs> Hi, and then you're going to have to wait until next week. <laughs> no, I, again, I had the pleasure of meeting Andy uh, a few years ago, and I've been on his coaching programs. And actually, I think Mark is still in the room. So Mark, um, uh, he delivered the training session, and it is awesome. So I bring to you the most awesome people that I have met that have actually had the most significant impact on me. So I am so excited, and uh, I've been excited ways for you today as well so thank you for your time Pleasure. i'm just thank gonna you. say goodbye to everybody on uh, facebook now so i'll just switch that one off okay and i'm gonna stop